Well, it is a joy to be with you today. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me and my family the privilege of worshiping with you all. Uh, I want to first just say a special word of thank you to your pastors and elders, especially uh, Robert and Steve. They have uh, been very, very kind friends in the Lord, a support to me uh, since I got here just a little over a year and a half ago. Uh, I did start right in the beginning of 2020 as uh, COVID was just around the corner, and uh, I had no idea. And so uh, in, this, in this past year and a half, uh, truly, Emmanuel Baptist Church, your pastors, the, uh, the pastors fraternal that you all just prayed for, uh, that has been a, a deep, deep blessing to me. So I, I want to thank you as a church family for your, your part in, in that. So uh, again, thank you. Um, greetings from the saints at Chinese Grace Bible Church. Uh, we are down in South Sacramento. That's actually where I grew up in the pocket Greenhaven area, and I grew up attending that church. Actually, went to uh, high school at John F. Kennedy, where Todd went. That was kind of a fun connection. Uh, so go Cougars, I guess, um, or something like that. Uh, but again, it's a, it's a joy to be with you. Uh, I want to I want to warn you. Uh, my church family knows that I, I preach long, and right before I got up here, I asked Steve, "Hey, or uh, yeah, what time? Not Steve, Robert. What time should I finish?" And he said, "Just preach till you're done." you know who to complain to. So um, just you get fair warning, fair, fair warning. And I know how much uh, Robert loves to reference old Scottish theologians. And uh, so I thought it would only be appropriate for me to also begin with a quote from my own heritage. According to Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu from the 6th century BC, there is no greater danger than underestimating your opponent. No greater danger than underestimating your opponent. This is decent advice, uh, whether you're thinking about your opponent in sports, uh, football, whether the American one or the wrong kind, um, or if it's your opponent in work or in war, this is decent wisdom. This has a measure of uh, common grace wisdom, as it were, but Lao Tzu was no Scottish theologian. Uh, as far as I know, he was not a believer, but I would argue that he was close, close but incorrect. The one thing more dangerous than underestimating your opponent is underestimating God. Underestimating God. In fact, the danger of underestimating God is exponentially greater, exponentially greater than underestimating even your fiercest opponent. Even still as redeemed children of God, it is a grave mistake to underestimate God who is our Savior and our Father. As cer certainly if you are not a believer, you ought not underestimate God who is your opponent. But even as his children, we ought not underestimate our Father. And there are some areas of life where a, a small error, a, a minor miscalculation can have massive consequences. But the place where there is the least tolerance for error is in our view of God, in our view of God. Like a, a compass our view of God de determines the direction of our lives. And, and so a small error in your understanding of God can lead you far off the path of life. Now, our, our error is, is never, never that we think too highly of God. None of us, none of you, not, no one will ever have a view of God that is too high, that is too lofty for him. Instead, our problem invariably every time is that our view of God is far too low. Far too low. It's been said that God made us in his image and we have been returning the favor ever since. Our view of God is never, never high enough. We are prone to wander into this dangerous error of underestimating our God. So tonight, I want to draw your attention to the Word of God in 2 Samuel 6. In 2 Samuel 6, I want to talk, draw our attention there and recalibrate our understanding of God. I want us to recalibrate what we think of when we think of God. Now, before we jump in, I want to give you some context for what we are talking about here, what's happening here in 2 Samuel 6. After Moses died, God brought the people of Israel into the Promised Land. So after the book of Deuteronomy, as you're hearing about in the, the morning services, they're brought into the promised land, and after a period of really compromise and idolatry during the period of the judges, it became clear that, that Israel needed a king. Not just a judge, they needed a king, a righteous king who would lead Israel according to God's word. That was their need. And the first king, Saul, was just what the people wanted, which was the wrong thing. He, he looked 
the part of the king. He was a head taller than anyone else, but in the end, he came up short. He did not have a heart for God. And so God rejected Saul and chose a, a little shepherd boy by the name of David. By the name of David. And after a long conflict between David and Saul, God finally established David fully and finally as the rightful king over all of Israel in 2 Samuel 5. This long protracted conflict is finally resolved with the death of Saul in 2 Samuel 5, and here David becomes king, finally, finally. And so that brings us to our passage. Now, 2 Samuel 6 is sort of like standing at the base camp of Mount Everest, because if you are familiar with, with the Bible and with 2 Samuel in particular, the next chapter, 2 Samuel 7, is the point where God makes this amazing promise to David. It's, it's the, the beginning of the Davidic covenant. God makes this covenant, this special promise that David would rule and that one day one of David's descendants would sit on the throne and reign forever. This is the promise that would lead to Jesus Christ, the true son of David. And so 2 Samuel 7 is, is one of the high points in all of redemptive history, and yet we are here in 2 Samuel 6 right before staring up at the summit. Why? Well, in this chapter, we really just get this little uh, record of God through David moving the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. In some ways, that's the only real event that happens of historical note. The Ark is brought into Jerusalem, so, so that could be mentioned in a footnote, in a verse. Why does God give us a whole chapter here? Well, it's because in addition to moving the Ark of the Covenant, this chapter teaches us important truths about our God. It, this chapter corrects and recalibrates and lifts up our view of God. And we all need this. Even David himself needed this correction, this recalibration. We all need this because our tendency is to fall into that danger of underestimating our God. So as we walk through 2 Samuel 6, we're going to be confronted by two necessary adjustments to our view of God. Two necessary adjustments to our view of God. Now, I'm not going to tell you what those adjustments are up front. I want to walk through this, this chapter, this narrative, with you and see if we can discover these things together. A little, a little mystery, a little hunt here together, all right? So 2 Samuel Chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Let me read the first five verses for us. The Word of God says this. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David went and uh, arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. Let's, let's pause there and do some Old Testament review. The, the ark, as you know, was a, was a wooden box that was covered with gold inside and out. Inside the, the ark were the Ten Commandments, a, a jar of manna, and Aaron's rod. And on top of the ark was this cover made of solid gold. And it was known as the mercy seat. It was known as the mercy seat. And, and on this mercy seat were two golden angels called cherubim. Cherubim. Now, these aren't like the cute fat baby angels that you often see in different kinds of artwork. Cherubim were most likely the highest order and rank of angels. They are fierce warriors. And these two golden cherubim are on either side of the mercy seat with their wings outstretched as if protecting, as if guarding something. They're facing each other. And, and if you trace the appearance of cherubim in the Old Testament, you'll see that they proclaim and guard the glory of God. Cherubim proclaim and guard the glory of God. They, in a sense, represent the inapproachability and transcendence of God. God is wholly other. 
that God is completely above and beyond his creation, that you and I cannot come near to God because we are holy and he is not, I'm sorry, because he is holy and we are not. That we are sinners. So cherubim come to represent this. If you remember, after Adam and Eve are, are exiled out of the garden, God puts cherubim there at the entrance of the garden with a flaming sword as if to say, you cannot approach God. You have sinned, and you must be out of the presence of the Lord now. And so these cherubim, they represent the, the glory, the holiness of God. They are guarding the, the, the glory of God from sinful man. And, and this is the ark, right? And it says that in, in chapter 6, verse 2, that the Lord is enthroned above the cherubim. Why? Because the ark, and especially the mercy seat there, would come to represent the very presence of God on earth the very presence of God on earth. Wherever the ark was, that was where God was. That was the idea here. So, so the Lord is enthroned above the cherubim. And because God dwelt, his presence dwelt above the ark there, you couldn't just leave the ark in the middle of wherever and have everyone look upon it, otherwise it'd be struck dead. The ark had to be tucked away inside this tent called the tabernacle, the sort of a mobile temple that they carried around with them in the wilderness. This tabernacle was, was designed not to let you in, but to keep you out from the presence of God. In fact, uh, the, the veil that would, that would cover the, the ark what had, had it woven into it cherubim. Again, you cannot come near. God is holy. You can't come into his presence. The ark had all these different sections to, to teach this lesson. No one could come into the presence of God except the high priest and only once a year to offer sacrifices. And so again, cherubim represent the inapproachability and transcendence of God. All legitimate worship was centered around the ark, but under the reign of King Saul, the ark had been set aside. The ark was not central. It was an afterthought. It was an afterthought. They, they left the ark in a town called Baal Judah or Kiriath Jerim in, in the house of a man named Abinadab that we just heard about. God was not worshiped. His presence was not sought. But now, Saul's out of the picture, and now David rises to power, a man after God's own heart, and he wants to restore the ark of God to its central and rightful place in Israelite worship. And so he wants to bring it from Baal Judah to Jerusalem, the capital. He wants to bring this into his own city, Jerusalem. Finally, the Lord's presence would be sought sacrifices would be made. He would be worshiped as he had commanded. And that's why everyone with David was celebrating 30,000 men to bring this little box into Jerusalem. And they are celebrating with songs and cymbals and tambourines, and they are rejoicing. But in verse 6, there is a sudden turn of events. There's a sudden turn of events. Look at verse 6. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Now, this is a joyous occasion, and the oxen stumble as they sometimes do. And, and Uzzah, possibly as a reflex, we, we don't know, possibly out of reverence for the ark, not wanting it to fall on the ground, he reaches out to steady the ark so it does not touch the ground. Now, you might expect the heavens to open up and for God to say, Thank you, Uzzah. I appreciate the help. Perhaps that's, that's what you would think. But instead, what happened? Verse 7 says, And the anger, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there beside the ark of God. Friends, God killed Uzzah. There was no warning. There was no second chance. God immediately struck Uzzah dead on the spot. And, and imagine the chaos. There's 30,000 people. There's music. People are celebrating. And all of a sudden, there's chaos. Chaos takes over this throng of people headed towards Jerusalem. And, and, and maybe word is spreading. People don't know what's going on. And finally, the news is clear. It's been confirmed. Uzzah is dead. How are we to understand this? This 
seems harsh. This seems unreasonable. This is not how I imagine or understand God to be. This is one of those passages in the Old Testament that, that causes modern readers like you and me to squirm a little, to feel a little uncomfortable. If we could, we would rather take passages like this out of the Bible. This, this doesn't line up with the way that I would prefer to think about God. This, this doesn't go well in our society. But therein lies the issue. If we, if we disagree with what Scripture says, it's not because the Scriptures are wrong. It's because we are wrong. If our, if our reaction to what God does is, is not positive, is negative instead, it's not because there's a problem with God, there's a problem with us. We are underestimating God. Well, first, let's, let's try to understand this a little bit. If, if you know the Old Testament well, you know that in Numbers 4, God gave specific instructions for the care of the ark. As the Israelites wandered through the wilderness, uh, the, only a certain group of men, the, the sons of Kohath, among the Levites, only this particular family was meant to carry the ark. And, and before they could carry the ark, they were supposed to take the veil and and cover the ark of God. Then they put poles through the rings on the side of the ark, and they would carry it on foot. Moses warned them, if you touched the ark or even looked at it, you would die. There were very clear, very, very clear instructions about this, because this was not just any old box. This was the throne of God. This represented the very presence of God, and so you could not take this too lightly. But in 2 Samuel 6, maybe you caught it, it's, it's even mentioned twice, they put the ark on a cart. But it's a new cart, the best cart. They put it on a cart. They failed to obey God's clear commands. In fact, the one other time the ark was put on a cart, it was done by the Philistines in 1 Samuel 6. When the Philistines captured the ark and they were cursed because of it, they sent it back on a cart. And so the Perhaps, we don't know, maybe the Israelites said, hey, that seems like an easier way to do it. Either way, they put it on a new cart. Now, if, if Uzzah was able to reach out and touch the ark, it appears as if perhaps the ark was not covered at all. And in that case, everyone with an eyesight of the ark should have been struck dead. Someone might object, but I, I, I thought God was loving. I thought God is kind. I thought God is gracious. Yes, he is, friends, but he is also Holy. God is holy, 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 holy. Even the sinless angels have to cover their faces in the presence of God. Even they do that. You see, the, the inapproachability of the ark of God was meant to teach us about the inapproachable holiness of our God himself. And so the, the first the first necessary adjustment that, that I need, that we all need, is that God is far more holy than you can imagine. God is far more holy than you can imagine. When we say God is holy, it means two things that are, that are somewhat related. First, God is utterly separate. He is utterly separate. He is transcendent. He is different than us. He is a cut apart, even a cut above. Totally different. Secondly, it also comes to have this, this idea that he is utterly pure and righteous. He cannot sin. He cannot even be tempted to sin. Instead, he hates sin sin, and therefore must punish sin. He must punish sin, or he is not the holy God that he claims to be. You might think, I might think, that, that we have a high view of God, that we do see him as, as holy, but it, it, simply, it simply cannot be high enough. We, we cannot think of him as holy enough. We all, at the end of the day, underestimate God and we underestimate God's holiness. We, we all do this. 
We all do this. We, we will never be able to think of God as more holy than he actually is. Like, oh, you've overshot it. No, no, no. That'll never happen. So, so to touch the throne or even the footstool of God, as the ark is sometimes called, is punishable by instant death. The, the ESV says that God struck Uzzah down for his error in verse 7. The, the NASB says Uzzah's sin was one of irreverence. One of irreverence. Right, R.C. Sproul in his classic book, The Holiness of God, he explains that, that Uzzah may have thought perhaps the ark would be defiled by the dirt if it fell off the cart. Because obviously the, the dirt would be worse than a human hand, right? No, Uzzah was wrong. The dirt was not what would defile the ark of God. Instead, it was the touch of sinful man. After all, the dirt does what God tells the dirt to do. But you and I, who have been made in the image of God, we are the ones who rebel, both in ignorance and in defiance. So it was not the dirt that would be so so contaminating. It was the touch of sinful man that was specifically forbidden. God's laws were perfectly clear. The ark should have been on a cart. It should have been covered. It should have been carried. And if Uzzah could speak to us today, he would stand before us and say, God was right to do so. God is holy. Holy, holy, holy. Do not underestimate him. My punishment was just. Yes, the Lord is gracious, forgiving, merciful, loving, but his grace, his forgiveness, and his mercy are, are, are gifts. Gifts that he is free to give or gifts that he is free to withhold. He is not obligated. We cannot obligate God to do anything for us. He is never obligated to show mercy. The problem is that you and I as sinners... We, we experience mercy, we're blown away the first time, but every time after that, we take it for granted. Oh, of course, of, of course God will forgive. We want to ask, why did God strike us a dead? But the right question is this, why hasn't God stricken each and every one of us dead just last night in our sleep? Because we would be deserving of that kind of justice. God would be right to do so, we forget that even the smallest sin is worthy of hell. Not because God is harsh, but because he is so holy, and even our smallest sins are sins of defiance against a good God. And so that's why we are shocked when God delivers justice, and we're bored by God's grace. We take this for granted, but 2 Samuel 6 is a wake-up call. And, and so if, if you are struggling with this idea of Uzzah's punishment being just, then, then I would submit to you that, that you need this adjustment in your thinking, that God is far more holy than you or I could imagine. So, so what happened next? And again, I'm not going to tell you the second point ahead of time. I want to see if you can get this on your own. So let's read from verses 8 to 10. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid. David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed Edom the Gittite. Three months. Three months it was there. It tells us in the next verse. David was initially angry, but his anger quickly turned into fear, which is, which is appropriate in light of God's holiness. David asked a fair question. If, if Uzzah was killed on the spot simply for touching it when it was about to fall, how could David bring the ark of God into his own city? How could he be so foolish to do such a thing? Was this a, a death wish? So David, David canceled his mission. He canceled it. Instead, he dropped off the ark at the house of the nearest Levite, Obed-Edom. Now, now, what would you expect to have happened to Obed-Edom? Uh, based on what happened to Uzzah, I would have expected uh, Obed-Edom to be dead in a number of days, if not sooner. If he had any children, they're gone. You tell children, don't touch that, it's as good as done. So, so you drop it off to Obed-Edom, uh, hey, uh, just don't touch it, and uh, see you later. <laughs> That's messed up, David. 
you would expect that every single person would die. But what happened instead? Look at verse 11. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months, and the Lord blessed. The Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. As if to, to add emphasis, look at verse 12. And it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him. What's the reason? Because, because, precisely because of the ark of God. Do you, do, did you catch this? Just a moment before, a man touched the ark and was killed, and now an entire household is blessed because of the ark. This, this explanation, this declaration of blessing because of the ark is the climax, is the plot twist to this whole story, to this whole chapter. This is the central point. Obed-Edom and his whole household should have died because of the ark, but the Lord blessed Obed-Edom precisely because of the ark. Uh, let, me, let me make sure this is clear for you. God's purpose and his intention is not to destroy his people but to bless his people. It is not to curse, destroy, tear down, but to bless, to love, to shepherd, to care for his people. His presence, God's presence, is a tremendous danger, but it's also an unguessable, incalculable blessing. Do you remember that, that, that great scene in C.S. Lewis's the, the Chronicles of Narnia, right? In that magical land, the, the children found out that the great King Aslan is, is a lion. And this, this King Aslan, obviously, if you've read this, he represents Christ. And, and the children find out he's this lion. And understandably, the children express some fear. And, and Lucy, the youngest, asked Mr. Beaver, then he isn't safe? And Mr. Beaver answered, safe. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And, and that is just a, a cheap, small, faded picture of what our great God is like. God is not safe. He is holy. He is even dangerously holy, and yet he is exceedingly good. He is exceedingly gracious. He is a God who blesses and blesses and blesses, and that's the second necessary adjustment to our view of God, that God is far more gracious than you could ever hope. God is far more gracious than you could ever hope. Just as you could not possibly overestimate God's holiness, likewise, you could never. You could never overestimate the graciousness and goodness and kindness of our God and Savior. You cannot. So <laughs> David was was deterred from his mission when, when Uzzah was struck dead. But then David now is reassured. He's reassured by this blessing of Obed-Edom's household. So, so David rejoices and he picks up his mission again to bring the ark of God into Jerusalem. And by the way, 1 Chronicles 15 is a parallel passage to this. 1 Chronicles 15, 15 tells us that they followed God's commands this time and carried it on, on poles, on poles. And now consider for a moment, right, that, that David, King David, a man after God's own heart, even he underestimated God's holiness and grace. If, if David could, could be off like that, if, if David could need a correction or an adjustment like that before, before this Davidic covenant would be, would be given to him, if he needed this kind of correction, so do we. So do you. So, so do I. 
God is far more holy than you can imagine, and God is far more gracious than you could ever hope. Now, let's look briefly at how this this story ends, And, and as we read through these verses, I want you to notice how the author refers to David's wife, McCall. David's wife, McCall. I want you to see how she is referenced. Now, now look back in with me at verse 12. It was told King David, the Lord had blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the, the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his house. And David returned to bless his household. But Michal the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the, ser- the eyes of his servants, uh, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. Now David is doing the only appropriate thing in light of God's blessing. In light of the blessing and the goodness and the grace of God and the ark coming into Jerusalem, David's doing the only appropriate thing. He's partying. He's celebrating. He is dancing. This is right. And instead of wearing a a dignified, kingly robe, he is wearing a linen ephod, which is what the priests would typically wear. This perhaps foreshadows the future son of David, who would be a king and priest righteously. And, And so he is wearing this linen ephod, not necessarily inappropriate, but certainly below the regal status of of what a king would normally wear. And Michal saw this, and she despised David in her heart. Now, did you notice how the word of God refers to Michal? What What did it say about her? She is the daughter of Saul, the daughter of Saul. How strange is that? She is the wife of David. Saul is dead. It seems like it would, be, it would have been a, a better way to say, hey, McCall, the, the wife of David. But instead, the author is doing something here that is very specific. I mean, after all, right, my, my wife's name is Abijah. And can you imagine me introducing her to you and saying, behold, Abijah, daughter of Edward. It's real odd. Robert, you sure you want this guy to preach? <laughs> no, no, no. I would say this is my wife, my beloved wife, Abijah. But the author of Samuel is making a point here. He associates Michal more with Saul than with David. She is not so much like the wife of David in her heart, in in her approach before the Lord, but she is more like Saul. She represents all that Saul stood for. She stood out of her window looking down upon the masses. She is despising David from her heart. Why? Because Saul, he looked the part of the king outwardly, but his heart was not for the Lord. So McCall rebuked David for not displaying the kind of dignity that a king should have, uh, like, like her father would have had. Like Saul, she is more concerned with the external than the internal. 
And David answered back strongly, reminding her that, that the Lord had chosen David over Saul. Now, you need to understand what's going on here, right? This is, this is not just a, a kind of regular picture of everyday marital conflict. I can't believe you are that out in public. I mean, a linen ephod, really? Come on. And this is also not a lesson on how to uh, solve an argument with your wife. Claim the Lord's choice of you over her father. <laughs> this is not what this is about. There is something else going on here. The Lord has chosen David as king, so McCall's attack on David is an attack on the grace and choice of God. And so McCall, the daughter of Saul, not the wife of David, was childless till the day she died. She was stricken and judged and left barren by God to the day of her death. The, the ultimate disgrace for a woman in Israel. Now this was a divine judgment on McCall for her contempt of David, as well as a judgment against Saul, because now Saul would truly have no part in David's lineage. And remember, David was, was dancing before the Lord with all his might. Why? Because of God's presence to bless, because of God's great and amazing and unguessable graciousness. And so McCall's contempt for David was also a contempt for God's gracious presence. David's rejoicing because the Lord is coming to Jerusalem, and McCall said, what's the big deal? She did not value the, the grace of God. She did not see this as pr pr uh, praiseworthy and, and of infinite worth. She should have joined in the celebration, but she refrained because she, at the end, had no interest in the things of the Lord. And when you take a step back and look at this, this entire chapter, this entire account, you, you notice something. In verses 1 to 11, David tried to bring the ark into Jerusalem, and Uzzah showed contempt for God's holiness, and God judged him by putting him to death. In the second half of this chapter, in verses 12 to 23, David brought the ark into Jerusalem, and McCall showed contempt for God's gracious blessing. And so God likewise judged her with barrenness. And, and Dale Ralph Davis makes this, this point here, that this chapter serves as a warning. Listen, this chapter serves as a warning to the casual worshiper like, like Uzzah, who does not take serious God's holiness. And, and this chapter also serves as a warning to the cold worshiper like McCall who is unmoved by God's grace. So these, these two halves of the chapter mirror each other and right in the middle, in the climax and plot twist of the story, the Lord reveals himself as one who is present to bless. To bless. That's the, the key, that's the central focus to this account. Now, brothers and sisters, it's no coincidence that these two, these two themes, God's holiness and God's grace, are placed together so closely here. This is how God is described time and time again throughout the Old Testament. Whenever God reveals his glory, he often highlights these two themes, his holiness and his grace. Just, just for one example, turn with me to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 to 7. And here's where God reveals himself. Moses had asked, God, show me your glory. Show me your glory. And God graciously answers in this way by not so much showing him something, but by telling him something. So what's amazing is Moses would see the afterglow of God's glory in such a way that his own face would shine. And just the afterglow of God's glory onto Moses' face, then shining in front of the people of Israel. They were scared to death, and he had to put a veil. And so he saw something, and yet what do we see in the Scriptures? We don't, we don't get any description about what he saw, but we are told what he heard because that was the point. In Exodus 34, verses 6 to 7, God reveals himself in these words. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but, but, who will by no means clear the, the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And of course, the response here in Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. This is how God describes himself 
And this self-description of God is echoed throughout the Old Testament, whether you look in Psalm 103 or, or even Jonah. This is the very imprint of who God is. Again, you see these two, if you could put it this way, the, these two sides of the character of God, the, the holiness of God and the grace of God. His justice and his mercy. Now, now these two sides are, are often misunderstood and, and pitted against each other as if God can only rightly be fully one or the other. And humanly speaking, I can understand why, right? It's much easier to think of God as a cold, cosmic judge who just sort of weighs out your life and, and puts it in the balance and says, guilty, not guilty. He's just this cold, merciless judge. Pharisees love this kind of portrayal of God. Many atheists hate this portrayal of God, and, and I would argue rightly so. Or it's perhaps easier to think of a benevolent heavenly grandfather who turns a blind eye to everyone's sins. Oftentimes lukewarm, worldly professing Christians like to think of God like this, or unbelievers who comfort themselves with this portrayal of God. They, they like this. I'm okay in his sight. But these two characters cheapen God's true holiness and his true grace. God is far more holy than the Pharisee thinks and far more loving than the worldly Christian thinks. God is far more. Do not underestimate him. God is neither of those characters. Our God is terrifyingly holy and he is radically generous. He pours out his wrath on defiant rebels and he, he runs to embrace filthy prodigals. Is there room in your theology for both? Our God cannot be divided. Our God is one, and he is perfect. He is more holy than you can imagine, and he's more gracious than you could ever hope. But if you want to fully understand how God can be devastatingly holy and overwhelmingly gracious, you, you have to move past just the, the ark in 2 Samuel 6. You have to move past the Old Testament into the new, and you need to look at Jesus, who is the exact image of God. In the Old Testament, God dwelt with Israel in the tabernacle through the ark, but in the New Testament, right? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us in the person of Jesus Christ. And, and the pinnacle, the apex, the highest point of the glory of Christ is not found so much in his miracles or his teaching, but in his death on the cross. The cross is the blazing center of the glory of God. And on the cross, God's holiness and wrath against sin was poured out in full on Jesus. And at the same time, the grace of God finds its fullest expression in Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, laying down his life to save all who would come to him. What holiness, what grace, what wrath, what love, it all finds its fulfillment here at the cross of Christ. He could not just sweep sin under the rug. There had to be payment. There had to be justice. So that justice was laid upon Jesus. Jesus bore the wrath that we so richly deserved, revealing the uncompromising holiness of God. At the same time, God's immeasurable grace and mercy were poured out as Jesus paid the infinite cost of forgiveness. Jesus suffered in the place of sinners. He suffered in the place of sinners, taking the punishment that you and I deserve so that if we would trust in him, if we would but come to him and cling to him, he would wash us white as snow. This is the best news there could possibly ever be. God is far more holy. God is far more gracious. And those two truths find their intersection at the cross at the cross. It's not enough just to stop at the fact that God is holy and gracious. You must come all the way and fully understand that this was shown for us once and for all, fulfilled for us in Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus, who is full of grace and truth, crucified and risen, is the clearest and final expression of the holiness and graciousness of God. These are the, the basics of what it means to know God, and yet we so easily underestimate it. So whether for you tonight, you are prone to think of God as holy, but 
stern and not gracious. Friends, let, let McCall's example be a reminder to you. If, if you approach God with a casualness, oh, God's not that concerned about these things. May, may Uzzah be a reminder to you. We, we, we ought never to underestimate God in any way. If you truly understand that God is holy and gracious, this radically alters your life. It, it radically alters the way that you fight sin, the way that you worship as one who is redeemed, not one who is working for approval. Friends, this changes everything about how you treat others, your spouse, your children, your neighbors. When you know that God is holy and gracious, this affects the way you live. You ought to pursue holiness because he's holy. You ought to fight sin because God takes sin seriously. And you ought to, to run to rebels, run to prodigals, run to those who hate God and tell them. Tell them that God is holy and tell them that God is gracious and that his presence, yes, is dangerous, but his presence is intended to bless. Is intended to bless. Friend, if you are here tonight, and somehow you have woven through church life here and do not know and have not trusted in this God, in this God who would crucify Jesus for you, then you need to turn and repent. You need to trust in him and rejoice. Not with gritted teeth, begrudgingly, but rejoice wholeheartedly in Christ the Savior. So let's learn. Let's learn from David's encounter with God that he is far more holy and far more gracious. Let's follow those two themes all the way to the foot of the cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the gift of your word and, Lord, the gift of the word incarnate, Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that you are far more holy and far more gracious than we can imagine. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us to not underestimate you. Help us to not have low and unbecoming thoughts of you. But instead, Lord, may you lift up our minds and our hearts by your word and by your spirit to see you as you are and to humble our hearts before you and to love you and to rejoice in you and to praise you because you are worthy. Lord, may our hearts be filled with worship for who you are and all that you have done. We pray this in the matchless name of Christ. Amen.